Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sharon Walmsley. I'm a professor of medicine at the University of Toronto in Canada, and I am co-director of the Canadian HIV Clinical Trials Unit. Uh, I've been given the privilege today to come to speak to you about the issue of aging, frailty, and the care of our HIV patients. Uh, here are my disclosures. I have uh, served on advisory boards, spoken at CME events, and conducted clinical trials uh, with all of the companies that deal with HIV products. So I think, as many of you are aware, um, there are these 2030 targets for HIV that of the 38 million people living with HIV around the globe, the goals are that 90% of people understand their HIV status, that of those 90% should be on HIV treatment, of which 90% of those should be virologically suppressed. However, there are many of us that believe that there should be a fourth 90 that the WHO should be looking at. And that fourth 90 is that our patients aging well with HIV. I think many of you are aware that that gap in life expectancy between people with and without HIV has been narrowing over time. And this is data from the Kaiser Permanente uh, that is looking at a cohort of individuals, of about 40,000 people with HIV and about 400,000 people without HIV who are matched on age, sex and race and looked at the life expectancy of HIV or not. And overall that gap is nine years. But it was determined that if those individuals initiated antiretroviral therapy, when their CD4 count was greater than 700, that that gap now was only seven years. But look at this data. This is data from 2006 to 2016. We know that there have been many changes in our management of people over that time. And many of us do believe that that gap in life expectancy will continue to narrow. However, there is another part to that gap, and that's comes to the part about aging well with HIV. And in the Kaiser Permanente cohort, they also looked at comorbidity. And as you can see, that comorbidity gap is greater, that uh, those with HIV, um, uh, without HIV, live 16 fewer years with comorbidity than those with HIV. And if you look at the graph on the right, you can look at that comorbidity gap overall of 16 years that you can see that there is increased cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, lung disease, and chronic kidney and liver disease. So that is the part that we need to continue to work on is to try and narrow that comorbidity free gap. Many of you are well aware of the fact that the HIV population is aging. And there are two reasons for that. One is of the new HIV diagnosis, and again, this is US data from 2018, that 17% of new diagnosis were those in individuals over the age of 50. But I think the bigger piece of the pie is the prevalence of aging people with HIV as we have new and better therapies. Now, more than half of individuals living with HIV are greater than 50 years of age. I think, again, a number of us are pushing many of the epidemiologic studies to take that um, uh, look at the population even greater and, and more granular, that over 50 is really big piece of the pie. And we really need to now to start to look at people not only more than 50, but more than 65, more than 70, more than 80 who are living with HIV. Now, when we take people with HIV in our clinic who are older, there are really two different subsets of the population. So first on the right, and this represents most of the patients in my clinic, these are individuals who acquired age at a younger age. And their HIV is often well controlled with modern antiretroviral therapy, but they have been living and surviving with HIV for a long period of time. Many of these individuals may have had quite marked immune suppression at the beginning of, the, of their infection with less immune recovery. They have had many years of exposure to some of those toxic earlier antiretroviral drugs. And again, those strategies where we use single nucleotides or combination therapy and did not have maximally suppressive uh, viral loads for many years. Also, these individuals, when they were diagnosed with HIV, they were basically told they were going to die. And so many of them gave up their jobs. They gave up their insurance programs. They gave up a lot of their resources. They lost a lot of their friends and partners and therefore often have a lot of financial concerns, given the fact that they don't have jobs, benefits or pension. 
We contrast that to our older HIV patients who actually acquired HIV at an older age. And many of these, in fact, are acquiring it at, uh, without understanding their sexual risk. For the women, it's often those who've been divorced, entered into new relationships at an older age, didn't need contraception and really didn't think that they would be at risk uh, for HIV. And remember also that women in the menopause, because of the changes in the vaginal mucosa, may be at higher risk for acquiring HIV. So these individuals actually have been diagnosed after the advent of modern antiretroviral therapy. They've only been exposed to our new drugs. Uh, but because of the fact that they often didn't perceive themselves at risk, may have been presented late and with an AIDS-defining uh, uh, illness. However, the vast majority of these people, in fact, didn't have those low CD4s or high viral loads and had been on suppressive therapy through the duration of their HIV experience and therefore may be quite different than the other population that we described. So we need to think ahead and we need to think ahead of our aging HIV population and, and what are we gonna to have to deal with as time goes on? And again, this is data from the NA Accord, looking at the projected burden of multimorbidity over time. And as you can see in the graph, uh, these are people at different decades of life and what we may anticipate going forward from now to 2030 in terms of comorbidities. And as you can see, that as you age with each decade of life, the number of comorbidities increase and the cumulative number of those comorbidities are, are going to increase with time. So we really need to be prepared clinically as how we are going to deal with these issues and how we're going to deal with these problems as our population continues to age. One of the big questions that I get asked all the time is are people with HIV at higher risk of cancer? And this is a question that we can't fully understand or fully answer at this point in time, uh, because again, our, our cohort is now just aging. And in the past, many patients would die of HIV and its complications long before a cancer other than those AIDS-defining illnesses would occur. And so we're only now starting to sort out and determine whether or not the risk of cancer is increased in persons living with HIV. And the argument is, even if you have control of HIV replication with, uh, with our current therapy and the CD4 count number is normal, is the function of those CD4 cells correct? Or is there going to be a problem with immune surveillance? And are these patients going to be at increased risk of cancer as they continue to age? And so this is data from the RESPOND study, which was a collaboration of 17 cohort studies that included over 30,000 people with HIV. Uh, these are individuals for whom they had uh, good data on their smoking uh, uh, um, on their smoking status. And as you can see, they divided them into two different CD4 and HIV RNA categories, good and poor, uh, as respect to um, uh, 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 all other categories. And what they were looking at here is the relationship between smoking status and the CD4 HIV RNA level in cancer. And one of the arguments has been that because the HIV infected population is more likely to smoking, is that what driving cancer or is it their HIV uh, parameters? So as you can see on the right hand side in the graph here that these individuals were on average uh, 46 years of age, three quarters of them were men. And as you can see, there was a variety of HIV transmission categories. Uh, many of them have been on antiretroviral therapy for up to 10 years. And as you can see, the smoking status is divided into about 40% never smoked, 44% currently smoking, and 15% having uh, uh, smoked in the past. And if we look at their HIV parameters, only 3% in the poor category with half in the intermediate and good categories. And what they were able to define is that there were four, 513 cancer events in 407, uh, 507 persons for an incidence of 6.9 per thousand person years. 85% of the cancers were non-AIDS defining cancers. And as you can see that about 40% of the cancers were thought to be uh, smoking related. So the incidence of cancer, if you look in the left hand side of the graph, was highest amongst current smokers as opposed to those who had previously smoked or never smoked. But if we look at the right hand side of this graph, 
the HIV status was also important uh, so that as you can see that the cancer risk was much greater in those individuals who did not have good control of HIV replication or had poor immune recovery. And there was no evidence in this study that the relationship between the current HIV status and cancer was different by smoking status. So again, really highlighting for us two important things. One is that we need to make sure that we address smoking in our patients as they age. And secondly of all, is making sure we maintain control of viral replication. So our patients who are aging with HIV have a lot of other concerns that go beyond their health. Uh, and this was a web-based survey that was conducted in 25 different countries of people aging with HIV more than 50 years, the vast majority of them who were HIV experienced. And what they really address is look, looking at older patients with a new HIV diagnosis. And again, as I alluded to earlier, most of the time these new diagnoses were as a consequence of social uh, uh, sexual contact, especially those who had multiple contacts. Uh, women had a higher likelihood of the new HIV diagnosis among the older adults. And these older persons being newly diagnosed with HIV were often unwilling to share this new diagnosis with family or friends because they're very concerned that this may restrict their social support. Uh, and they're also sometimes not willing to share this diagnosis with their healthcare practitioners for fear that it would lead to fragmented care. Of those, um, although it was clear that antiretroviral therapy was important, they were very concerned that starting HIV treatment and having those pills was going to lead to unwanted disclosure of their status, particularly depending upon their living environment. And before they started HEART, they were really concerned about issues related to side effects and issues related to the cost of the medications. Uh, the newly diagnosed HIV experienced patients thought that we can do better in terms of treating them, and they had much more interest in being involved in their cure decisions. So the DHHS has uh, published in their guidelines some of the considerations that we should uh, make when caring for older persons. And I can't stress enough, the importance is really to maintain a very good history of antiretroviral regimes. What had people been on in the past? What was the sequence of events? And then what happened with each of those regimens? Did they respond? Did they not respond? Did resistance develop? Were there side effects? And this is really, really important as we continue to treat these patients uh, into later life to make sure that we maintain appropriate uh, control. And many of these older patients have been from one doctor to another, and sometimes it's really difficult to have these records. I think we all are aware of the fact that many of our older patients surviving with HIV were in the era of monotherapy and sequential dual therapy and therefore may have underlying resistance and may not be controlled with some of our single tablet regimens of today. And many of these patients, in fact, were on antiretroviral therapy before we even had resistance tests. And so sometimes we have to infer that there may be an underlying resistance profile when we, in fact, do not have that information. I think the other thing that we need to recognize is that it goes beyond the HIV and that in your clinic, you really need to think about some of the other medical and social services that may be required to manage both the HIV and their comorbid conditions. For example, in our clinic, uh, we have an osteoporosis specialist that we work very closely with. We have a nephrologist who works directly in our clinic. We have certain individuals that we can refer people to for their cardiovascular disease or underlying diabetes. Uh, we have psychiatry in the clinic. We have a hepatologist in our clinic to allow us to provide that patient-centered care. Remember in the elderly that adverse drug reactions may be more common and because these individuals often have multiple comorbid diseases, there's often concerns about drug-drug interactions. So it's really important to involve your pharmacist in their care and to have one of these websites where you can look at the potential interactions. Neurocognitive function is going to decline as these people age and mental health issues uh, will emerge. And so it's really important that you have means to assess and monitor these as needed. And also think about those factors that may impair 
their ability to adhere uh, to heart therapy. So I think as we move forward, I think many clinics now are looking at these care models wherein we can provide all of this uh, uh, necessary components of patient's health in a one uh, patient setting. So when to start heart, and I don't think anybody in this audience uh, doubts the fact that if you have HIV, you should treat it. And as we all learned from the START study many years ago, uh, the benefits of early uh, initiation of HIV therapy, not only to avoid AIDS-related events, but non-AIDS-related events. But if you happen to be in a resource-limited place, it's important that you start heart early, particularly in the elderly population. And so on the right-hand side here is a sub-study of the START study looking at individuals more than 50 years of age, comparing immediate to deferred heart. And you can see the magnitude there of the difference between the early versus uh, late heart um, arms. So it's particularly important for your older individuals that you get HIV therapy started as soon as they're diagnosed. And of course, there's always that question as to whether the elderly are going to have as good of immune recovery as younger cohorts. And so it's really important to get that started early. So what do we start with? And I think most of our guidelines now would suggest that individuals initiate antiretroviral therapy with an integrase inhibitor, either dolutegravir, bictegravir, or raltegravir on a backbone of either tenofovir or tenofovir alafenamide together with emtricitabine or a backbone of abacavir and 3TC. And I think, again, we should recognize that the guidelines do not make any specific recommendations for the elderly, but really say that it's important that you consider their other medications uh, when, cho when choosing therapy. This is just a breakdown of many of the pivotal trials of the integrase inhibitors, separating those individuals who are less than 50 years of age to those who are more than 50 years of age, starting with the Startmark trial, which was an evaluation of raltegravir, the single studies, which were evaluation of dolutegravir, and then the study uh, 1489 and 90, looking at bictegravir, and then finally the Gemini trial, looking at the combination of dolutegravir in a single uh, nucleoside. And as you can see, older individuals respond just as well in terms of suppression of viral replication as our younger individuals. So all these regimens appear to be excellent for our older patients as well as our younger patients. Uh, this is data from Africa. It is the same thing uh, happening there? So this is a study in Africa looking at about 3,000 individuals looking at viral suppression by age group. And as you can see on the graph, those individuals less than 50 years of age were suppressing viral load as well as those older than 50 years of age. But then the question comes is, is there as good of immune recovery in our older patients as our younger patients. And this has been uh, debated for some time. And it's been confounded by the differential initiation of antiretroviral therapy early or late in, in disease and by some of our newer compounds. Uh, if we look at this uh, African study, they did not find any difference in CD4 count recovery by age group, but I caution you that the number of individuals in the older age group in this study was only 44. Uh, more recently, uh, one of the fellows working with me on the Canadian Observational Cohort Study, what we looked at was CD4, CD8 uh, ratio normalization. And I think many of you are aware of the literature that shows that this is a very good predictor of uh, the risk of, of comorbidity development over time and also is an indication of a uh, total body burden of HIV. And what we set out to determine is whether CD4, CD8 ra ratio normalization uh, varied by age. And we also wanted to determine whether or not it was influenced by the antiretroviral class that was initiated. Uh, so in our cohort, we had uh, over 3,000 uh, people. And the bottom line was that the earlier initiation of heart with higher baseline CD4 counts had the greatest impact on CD4, CD8 normalization. And so we are hoping that that will pour trends into less comorbidity over time. We found that normalization, surprisingly, was more likely in women than in men, but we did not find any association uh, with antiretroviral uh, class. <clears throat> 
Uh, so again, supporting the earlier uh, initiation of antiretroviral therapy, regardless of the age at which your HIV is diagnosed. So another thing that we need to think about is, you know, what impacts the ability of our older individuals to function well. And uh, many of you have heard Dr. Giovanni Garaldi from Italy talk about the comprehensive geriatric assessment that looks at functional status, comorbidity, cognition, nutrition, polypharmacy, and social support as being a very important component of the overall assessment of our aging HIV patients. Uh, and there are simple ways to do this. And one is to adopt the so-called 5M, the geriatric approach. Think about their mind, think about their mobility, their medication, their multi-complexity. But I think a really important one is what matters the most to me? And that is a question that we really need to think about when we're dealing with our HIV patients who are aging with HIV and really make sure we understand what is important to them to maintain the quality and function of life that they really depend. And then the sixth M, what is modifiable and what can we improve upon? Uh, so I'm going to turn now to a couple of cases uh, of older individuals who have been recently in my practice with just uh, pointing out some of the key features about managing uh, older patients. Uh, so this is a 81 year old woman who presented to my clinic in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, this is a woman who had immigrated from Denmark 60 years ago. She'd been widowed for 22 years, lived alone and had a pension. In terms of her medical history, she'd had a hysterectomy in the past. She had colon uh, cancer surgery years ago and chemotherapy and was considered to be cured. And her medications included uh, uh, hormone replacement therapy and L-thyroxine. Uh, so this individual presented to a family doctor with a history of weight loss of 10 pounds over two years and dysphagia. And of course, the weight loss is what precipitated her initial investigation. And of course, this woman had a history of colon cancer and chemotherapy. So of course, everybody thought, of course, this is a recurrence of her cancer. But when the dysphagia happened and somebody looked in and saw a thrush, ah, surprise, and the HIV test was done, uh, which was um, uh, found to be positive. Uh, the transmission source for this woman at the time she was tested uh, was unknown. Uh, but when she came to my clinic, although she'd had no male partners for the past five years, well, maybe there was someone of concern about 10 years ago. Uh, she did not use drugs, uh, had never had a blood transfusion or any other uh, things to be concerned about. Uh, so when I saw this woman, she was quite thin. It says 110 kilos. That's incorrect. That should be 110 pounds. Uh, she had some difficulty hearing and obviously had oral candidiasis. So again, what matters most to me, it was the dysphagia and the weight loss that was of most concern to her. And that was the thing that needed to be immediately addressed and fluconazole uh, was prescribed for her. Uh, so uh, uh, when we worked up her HIV status, uh, her HIV RNA was 289,000 copies. Her CD4 count was very low at 39 copies per mil. Her genotype was wild type and her HLA B5701 was negative. Uh, she was not immune to hepatitis B. She uh, had a little bit of a low hemoglobin. She had a low albumin. Uh, as part of the workup, uh, she was found to have some hemangiomas in her liver that were stable and, and not to be concerned. Uh, so my answer to this woman is, is, you know, I don't think that HIV is going to impact your life expectancy. Okay, but let's try and, and get you controlled to get you suppressed to try and minimize uh, any additional uh, comorbidities. Uh, so this just brings the fact that, you know, one of the reasons why older people like her are being diagnosed late in HIV is because it wasn't considered. And uh, she did not consider herself to be at risk. And I'm sure her primary care physicians were not having discussions about her sexual practice. And therefore, older individuals are less likely to be uh, tested and diagnosed with HIV. And on the right-hand side, you can see some data from the CDC looking at 
um, the time or uh, what proportion of people have AIDS at the time of their HIV diagnosis. And you can see as each decade of life increases, the proportion of individuals presenting with an AIDS diagnosis increased. And of course, this woman had esophageal candidiasis, so does present with AIDS, an extremely low uh, CD4 count. Uh, so next question is, what about the interval between HIV infection uh, and diagnosis? Again, sort of on the similar uh, theme of that previous. And again, this is data from the CDC National HIV Surveillance System. Uh, looking, uh, and again, this is a little bit old data, between 214 and 218 on the time of infection to diagnosis. And you can see that overall, it's approximately 40 months. But again, in 2014, the older the individual, the longer the time uh, to diagnosis. Uh, but as we can see in 2018, although we've not really made a whole lot of, of, of impact uh, on that, uh, e e e even in our elderly population. So we need to keep thinking about that. But then the next question is, what about the time between HIV diagnosis and viral suppression? And as we alluded to before from the When to Start study, it's really important for uh, older adults being diagnosed with HIV that they get put on effective antiretroviral therapy uh, as soon as possible. So again, this data is a little bit old, but if we look at 2012, on average, it took about nine months uh, for people to be suppressed. And if you look at the age decades, that the older individuals uh, seem to be suppressing viral load uh, as well um, uh, as younger individuals, but that it was taking, uh, you know, seven to 10 months. In 2017, we can see now that we're doing better, okay? We're getting people suppressed faster, uh, and there does not seem to be a difference by uh, age group so that we are getting individuals uh, suppressed very quickly, and this is also a consequence of our newer uh, integrase inhibitors. So back to our woman, uh, this woman did get started on therapy uh, with uh, Bictegravir, uh, with emtricitabine and tenofovir alafenamide. She got put on trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole because of her low CD4 count. Uh, her dysphagia and her oral candidiasis uh, resolved. Uh, but again, now we have to deal with what about comorbidities? Uh, and as you recall, uh, this is an 80-year-old woman and you know she's going to be at trouble um, with her bones. Uh, as we know, as women age uh, in the general population and they lose uh, hormonal control, but there is increased risk of osteoporosis and um, uh, decreased bone mineral density and a risk of fracture. Uh, so this is data from the HOPS cohort uh, looking at incident fracture rates and mortality among people uh, with HIV. Again, an older prospective cohort between 2000 and 2017. And as you uh, look at this, there is a risk of mortality among those individuals with fracture. Uh, and fractures are associated with mortality that there are other factors that become important, such as chronic kidney disease, hepatitis C co-infection, and odds uh, non-AIDS defining cancer. So incident fracture is independently associated with a 45% increase in all mortality, all, all cause mortality. So in this woman, I would think that her risk of falling, having a fracture, uh, and causing death far outweighs any risk of her having death from an HIV related concern. So are there things that we can do for these individuals? And again, uh, we've all heard the stories that uh, tenofovir in its previous formulation was associated with a decreased risk of bone mineral density. Uh, and um, that, uh, that with um, the use of tenofovir alafenamide or with the use of abacavir and 3TC that we see less decrease in bone mineral density. And that was particularly marked in those over 50 years of age. Uh, one of the questions we don't have an answer to is, is whether or not this is also evident for postmenopausal or perimenopausal women, because again, the number of women in these studies over 50 years of age uh, was quite limited. 
This is data from the BEST study that was looking at switch studies. So these were women over 40 years of age who got switched to Abacavir and 3TC, uh, demonstrating that there was a modest but statistically significant increase in the bone mineral density of the hip and spine in those individuals when they were switched from a tenofovir-containing regimen to one uh, containing uh, Abacavir and 3TC. So uh, from the WIS study, which is a study of women with HIV uh, compared to an HIV negative but at risk population, we find that frailty can be an indicator or risk factor for falls uh, in aging women with HIV. And as you can see, it's particularly a risk for recurrent falls. So on the right-hand side of the graph, the orange, the lighter orange is those with HIV and the reddish box is those without HIV. And the risk of recurrent uh, falls was seen more commonly in those with HIV, but really the greatest risk uh, was a frailty. Okay, here's a second patient in my practice. This is an older man. Um, I looked after him for many, many years. He's now a retired advertising executive who's lived with his current partner for more than 20 years. He's outlived many of his partners in the past. He was diagnosed with HIV more than 30 years ago when his T-count was 163. Uh, he's been a, a real trooper in many of our clinical trials and has been in one study after another and basically has had an undetectable viral load for 20 years with a T-count of 400 to 500. So well controlled from the HIV point of view. Uh, so he presented to my clinic with functional and cognitive decline. Uh, he had had fatigue for many years, but was now having increasing memory loss a sensation of lightheadedness, having difficult with his balance and starting to fall. Uh, he started to withdraw from his activities of daily living and started to withdraw from his social encounters, now relying on his partner for doing the cooking, the cleaning, helping him to the subway, obviously gave up his fitness uh, program. And we sent in a team uh, to kind of see what was going on at his home and to have a home assessment. And one of the answers from the pharmacist is that there were pill bottles everywhere. Uh, so at this time, he's on uh, darunavir boosted by ritonavir together with emtricitabine and uh, tenofovir, as I said, suppressed with a good CD4 count. Uh, so what, well, what we did first was a little screening test and we used the Montreal Cognitive Assessment uh, for HIV and found him to qu have quite uh, marked impairment with uh, a score of 16 out of 30. Uh, so the question really from him and his partner, like, is this typical? Is this the HIV? Is this just aging? Is there something else? What are the reasons for his functional and cognitive decline? And of course, you know, at this point in time, we do not have experience with a lot of people with HIV over the age of 70 and trying to sort out these various cog causes of cognitive decline are difficult. Uh, as you all know, in the past, there was this uh, disorder called HIV-associated neurocognitive disorder, which was divided into a series of steps, either asymptomatic, mildly uh, asymptomatic, or HIV-associated uh, dementia, in which there were degrees of cognitive decline and degrees of functional status. However, trying to make a formal hand diagnosis is difficult and it does require a, a series of neuropsychological uh, tests and interpretation. Uh, hand was something that we saw very, very commonly uh, before in the HIV epidemic, but how much of it is due to our former inability con to control viral rep replication, leaving people with uh, HIV replication for prolonged periods of time, failure to recover CD4 counts, and then the confounding effects of depression, injection drug use, and all of that uh, have continued. Uh, HAND seems to be decreasing over time as we've initiated antiretroviral therapy earlier uh, in disease, uh, but it does still exist to some degree.
Uh, so rather than doing a formal hand diagnosis, I think many of us in our clinic are going to need uh, simpler tools uh, for uh, looking at neurocognitive disorders. This is the one that we use uh, in our clinic, something called the MOCA, uh, which is the Montreal Cognitive Assessment that looks at short-term memory, visual spatial abilities, executive functions, attention concentration, working memory, language, and orientation to time and space. And um, it can, uh, it's been very well validated in, in the setting of mild cognitive impairment. And there is a score rating that helps you uh, uh, put people into categories. So this is a useful tool. You can do it simply in the clinic. And it is something that you can follow prospectively over time as our patients age to determine whether or not uh, cognitive impairment is continuing to progress or not. Uh, and so of our aging patients with HIV, some of the things that we need to look at is, you know, their disability, their frailty, their comorbidity, their cognitive function. And then this whole concept is, is there premature or accelerated aging? And what can we do to ensure that they have successful aging? So again, getting back to this whole issue of frailty, and this is data from the age HIV cohort study from the, from the Netherlands. Uh, and what they were trying to see is that persons aging with HIV have an increased risk of frailty relative to the general population. And that frailty again, does impact morbidity and mortality, not only in terms of fractures, but also in terms of, uh, of um, of death. So again, this is another scale, another um, tool that you can use in your clinic with older individuals, and you can uh, watch their frail, measure their frailty, and, and follow it over time. But then, so we discover it. So what do we do? Uh, and so we'll exercise study. Uh, we'll exercise uh, improve their status. And this is a, a study that was presented by Lanson and AIDS a couple of years ago. That was a prospective uh, study of adults uh, aging with HIV and those without HIV. Uh, and they were randomized to varying degrees of exercise. And they were able to demonstrate that there was a significant improvement in functional uh, measures and that persons uh, aging with HIV had even greater in, in improvements uh, than in, in controls. Obviously, such programs have been hampered by the COVID pandemic, um, but many uh, different places now are trying to look at video ways of encouraging our older patients to do exercise in order to improve uh, their physical function. Uh, so back to my uh, patient, you know, what about some other things? Um, he did never had any HIV related complication, but had a number of comorbidities. He had mixed lipodystrophy from some of his previous therapies. He had dyslipidemia for which he was on a statin. He had chronic obstructive pulmonary disease for which he was on an inhaler. He had cataracts that were in, in, impairing his vision. He had benign prostatic hypertrophy for which he was on Tamlucin. And he now had these cognitive and functional uh, disturbances. He had been seen by a neurologist who wondered whether or not his cognitive impairment may be a manifestation of Parkinson's disease. So he had been placed on uh, carbidopa to see if this would uh, help improve his cognitive function. The other thing in the elderly that we always need to address is this whole issue of uh, polypharmacy. Uh, and we all know that in the general population, there is an increase of polypharmacy with age, and in those living with HIV, this risk of polypharmacy increases even more, uh, given the fact that they take antiretroviral drugs and have more comorbidity. And we know from various studies in the literature that polypharmacy does increase the risk of hospitalization and does increase the risk of uh, mortality. So again, it's really important in our older populations that we always address this polypharmacy. We consider every, anti, every drug that these patients take. Do they really need them? What are they for? What is their purpose? And then also consider the drug interactions, particularly with regards to their HIV therapy.
And what we've learned in persons living with HIV, that polypharmacy is associated with the greater odds of falling. And we've already talked about falling and frailty and fractures and death. And so it's really important that we, again, address the medications in terms of this. Uh, and in this study, the medications that were, uh, these are the sort of the 10 top medications that were associated uh, with a false. And if we go back to my patient, he was on uh, many of these therapies. So again, we need to address this. And I think many clinics now are looking at medication de-escalation programs, uh, particularly uh, in our aging patients. So um, this is data from David Back and others that deal with a lot of issues with respect to medications and polypharmacy and the elderly. And these are their so-called 10 drug classes to avoid in persons aging with HIV because the impact on their co cognition, because of potential anticholinergic reactions, because of the risk of falls uh, and other issues uh, that could impair their function and quality of life. So what do we need to do? We need to do medication reconciliation, we need to review the prescriptions. What are the indications and stop anything that's not necessary? We need to always consider the dose as patients age and may have deterioration in their liver or their kidney function. We need to think about how long they've been on these drug-drug interactions and get rid of those that are inappropriate uh, and be very aware of the so-called prescription cascades, prescribing drug A and then drug B to deal with the side effects of drug A, et cetera, et cetera. And we really need to prioritize these medications according to the risk and benefit of an individual patient, considering their preferences and educate, educate, educate. So when we think about our clinical management of an older person, we really do require a comprehensive approach that we need to pick up HIV in our older adults. We need to start them on antiretroviral therapy as soon as possible. We need to screen and manage them for comorbidities. We need to promote lifestyle changes such as diet, exercise, and smoking. We need to look at their drugs and reduce their pill burden and the risk of polypharmacy and always assess for function and preserve their quality of life. So aging well with HIV. So what are we in our clinic and me, particularly in terms of my research, doing to address the aging population? We have two different studies that we are doing right now. The first is something called PANASH, the Preferences and Needs for Aging Care Among HIV Elders in Canada. And what we are is we're developing a natural survey of the care needs and preferences of an older group of, uh, of adults living with HIV, uh, whose experiences are representatives of their peers from out Canada. Uh, and we have been successful in getting a CIHR grant uh, uh, from our Canadian uh, funding agency. And I'm working on this uh, with one of our community partners. Uh, the second study that I'm in charge of is something called Change HIV, which is uh, correlates of healthy age and geriatric uh, HIV. And uh, we've been successful again to uh, uh, have acquired a CIHR team grant to enable us to establish the first Canadian geriatric cohort of persons living with HIV. And we're planning to enroll 750 people over 65 years of age. We've been a little bit hampered by the COVID epidemic, but we're well underway. And the purpose of this team grant is to characterize the health experience of people aging with HIV, uh, to use uh, or examine the concept of healthy aging using a validated multidimensional index and to examine the change in the score over time. And then to identify the personal and environmental determinants of health that predict having a healthy aging score and the extent to which these relationships may change over time. We also have a biological component where we're looking to see uh, biologic determinants, both systemic immune activation factors and gut microbiome diversity to determine whether or not this is correlated with a healthy aging score or the score over time. Uh, so we have a very large view of healthy aging, and these are the domains of health in which we will uh, be evaluating health and aging in our population. And we will be looking at some of the environmental determinants of health and the personal determinants of health and the factors uh, that may impact upon it. 
Uh, so the main study is, is primarily through questionnaires. We have a huge burden on our individuals that overall they, they complete about 37 questionnaires, but we have divided them into components. And uh, although we were doing this with them in person in the clinic because of the COVID pandemic, we had to shift and we now have them uh, be able to do these uh, questionnaires at home on their own. There are some physical maneuvers uh, such as determining the frailty score and things like this, which we do with the coordinator. And these individuals will have two or three visits uh, over five years uh, uh, for us to examine them. We have this microbiome, as I mentioned, a microbiome uh, sub-study in which we will be looking at biomarkers of inflammation and we'll be looking at the gut microbiome in addition. Uh, so we are uh, going to, as our primary endpoint of the study, use something called a healthy aging score, which we have adapted from the Rotterdam healthy aging score that was done in the general population. It's a fairly simple score that we can do, and it has been validated against hospitalization and mortality in the Rotterdam study. Uh, so the domains of health that are evaluated include quality of life, social support, physical function, mental health, and cognitive function. And you come up with a score of zero to 14 that can be monitored over time and may be an endpoint that we can use in interventional trials. Uh, so we did a pilot study of the uh, healthy aging score in our population. And as you can see, we had quite a marked distribution in the frequency of the score in the sub-study of 100 patients that we studied. And as we anticipated, uh, there was a difference in distribution uh, by age with younger individuals tending to have uh, better scores than older individuals. But it was interesting that components of the score. And often our younger individuals have more uh, impairment in some of the um, depression and cognitive uh, parts or mental health components of the score, whereas the older individuals, as expected, had more difficulty uh, with some of the physical uh, components of the score. So that's what we're doing. And I'm going to uh, sum up my lecture and invite uh, questions if we're able to do that through this format. Um, but I want to conclude that the population with HIV is aging as a consequence of new infections in an older population and a greater prevalence due to the longer duration of infection with our improved management. And although survival rates are approaching that of the general population, there does seem to be an excess of comorbidity. So there are multiple medical, medication, social, function, and psychosocial challenges that need to be dealt with for a person aging with HIV. And you need to think about these uh, in your own clinic. Uh, so I thank you for your interest, and I hope uh, that we can continue to support our aging individuals, and we will keep you posted as to the results of our, of our studies. I thank you.